Um, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm John Bauer. I'm a current board member, past president, and uh, I'm going to be your MC this evening. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, housekeeping it, um, things. The restrooms are non-gender, and they are by the yellow wall over here. So you just and you'll go in there. Um, exits right here and on the other end of the building, so if, just in case. Um, we encourage you to please sign in so that we can add you to our occasional newsletter. Steve's got the clipboard, uh, so uh, he'll be happy to help you out with that. I um, want to thank Sun Common for supplying this room and filling my car with free electricity because, uh, you know, brought by the sun. Uh, and uh, thank you, Tom, for coming and helping us out with this. Um, also, thanks to Cold Hollow Cider for the cider and donuts this evening, which are on the back table. Please help yourself, because we don't want to take any home. So eat them up. Uh -huh. Let's see, we have a pretty good agenda tonight. Um, and hopefully, we'll have time for questions. Uh, but if not, we have forms scattered around on the tables. Um, if you have a question and we didn't get to it this evening, uh, please fill it in and uh, add your uh, contact information, and somehow we will get that answer to you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we are collecting donations in one of our handy, um, well, we, we have these uh, fishing line recycling bins that we scattered around the reservoir. Uh, Tito's got one over there. Um, so if you have cash that you want to leave for the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir, uh, feel free to drop it in there. We also have calendars for sale, free stickers and that sort of thing. That's all on the table in the back by the kitchen. Uh, so peruse that um, and, and have a look. Um, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? Oh, Bob, we are available on the web. Instagram and Facebook, and we would love it if you would follow us there. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our board. Eric Chittenden is our president. Raise your hand, Eric. Thank you very much. Sheila Goss is our vice president over here. Uh, Francine Chittenden is our treasurer. She's in the back and ready to take your money. <laughs> um, we also have uh, board members Mike Baird. Is Mike here? There he is. Um, Emma is here, Emma Brownlee, and her father, Steve Brownlee, is here. Walt Carpenter, who also works at the day use area. And uh, Tito Keefe from uh, Pack and Ship, who is our new board member. Pretty close. Pretty close? Pack and Send. All right. <laughs> Pack and Send. Pack and Send. OK, we got that. Um, so we have an agenda tonight. We'll have Eric will bring, give you some, uh, have some remarks to open things up. We've got Benjamin Green to update us on the dam repair that's uh, coming to a reservoir near you. Uh, Francine will offer a brief financial report. Uh, Zach Johnson will talk about our greeter program. Sheila Goss will tell us about the loon raft and the fishing line recycling bins. Uh, Floating Ranger Ben Fulton is here to talk about his experiences in the last year. And uh, finally, Chris, uh, Kristen Sharpless and Alan Thompson will talk to, about the proposed wildlife corridor, which uh, is near the, and it abuts the, the reservoir. But before we get going with all of that, <laughs> Sheila Goss has a brief presentation. I have a brief presentation because... Now you have to come up here. I'm coming up there. All right, don't start talking. I'm coming come up, up there. there. <laughs> and this is a surprise, but I think that John went through the list of those of us who are fortunate enough and honored to serve on the board for this organization to help our mission to preserve this reservoir for all users. But there's one person on the board that... I'm constantly amazed at the amount of work that Eric Chittenden puts in. And I'm talking 24-7, year-round. It's unbelievable um, the amount of work he does and the love he has for the reservoir and also for this organization. So we decided that Eric should be the first to receive the beta version 
of the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir t-shirt. <laughs> We know that he will wear it with pride. There you go, Eric. Thanks for all your hard work. <laughs> well, Eric, you're next. I'm next. Okay. I want to start talking, John, to the up there. I'm so glad that you follow directions. <laughs> Well, I, too, wish you, thank you for coming and, and um, braving the weather and making it up here. Um, got a fair amount of ground to cover tonight, so my comments are going to be pretty brief. As you know, when, you, when, you, <clears throat> when you're president of an organization like this, a big part of your job is, is uh, fundraising. And uh, that's what we've been busy doing recently. And I do thank uh, Joan Bauer for for uh, standing in and and uh, conducting the meeting and I'm seeing it. He's a, he's a lot smarter than I am, and uh, and he's uh, much more entertaining. <clears throat> but he's also a great clock watcher, so he's going to watch. He's going to make sure we're out of here on time. Yeah. Uh, some of the people we need to thank, the, uh, uh, the residents of Waterbury and the town of Waterbury. The, uh, <clears throat> the town actually manages the uh, ANR uh, money that we get, and uh, it's a pass-through program, so they put quite a bit of effort into that every year. And, uh, and the residents of the town, last year we had a little fundraise, well, well it was a a signature petition we had, which if you want to get a, an appropriation from uh, your town, you have to get 5% of the si uh, signatures of, from the voters. <clears throat> so we succeeded in that, and so now we have that coming in every year. So then, and we have to, of course, thank the, the residents, because uh, they're the ones really ultimately a foot in the bill for that. Uh, it's the town of Stowe it gives us a $500 appropriation every year. They never asked for signatures or anything. It's been something that they've been doing for several years now. Uh, Sheila, do you know how many years they've been doing that? Mm -hmm. At least six or seven. Yeah, anyway. quite, quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one of our uh, members, the Leo. Uh, Bellavo uh, donated about $300 worth of uh, PVC pipe for the uh, fish line bins. So I need to thank him and uh, all the volunteers who sh just show up when we have stuff to do. They, they come out of the woodwork, and uh, it's uh, very heartwarming to see that. <clears throat> and uh, just hours ago, uh, we uh, received a word from Lawson's Lost its finest liquids. Got to put the finest in there, she said, and uh, and they will <clears throat> they'll support us for the second year in a row with a, a generous donation of fifteen hundred dollars. So it's a real help. But <clears throat> so next time you're enjoying one of those uh, Lawson's finest sip of sunshines, uh, think about them and and uh, their generosity. Those of you who work for uh, an organization, especially large organizations, uh, keep in mind that many of these organizations have matching grants, and so you can always ask that question, and you get a few of those every year, and it's uh, very, usually very supportive money for what we're doing. And, and last, but by no means, well, at least the board of directors, we have a very energetic, creative, uh, how can I say, creative and, and very engaged uh, board of directors. They, they come out of the woodwork and it make my work pretty easy. So, and everybody here should know that they got a, a voice on the res, so if, uh, 
and you should use it. So <clears throat> mention, uh, I wanted to mention the, the kiosks that were put in. Uh, we had uh, recommendations from a lot of users that they wanted to see more information at the res. So we mentioned that to the Forest and Parks, so at that time it was <clears throat> another team, but uh, within two seasons, I think there are nine of them around the reservoir now. And, uh, and the Blush Hill parking, the, we gave a presentation to the uh, Rotary Club, and a lot of the Rotary Club folks live up on Blush Hill, because they, they like to golf, I think. So anyway, they it was getting pretty, much used up there and a lot of traffic so we made that mention to the state and this year they put in a little parking lot it does it's, it's only seven or nine how many francine is yeah but it, it'll it'll take some of the the pressure off the the use of the highway and they also paved it last year so that was a huge improvement so that's uh, that's all i've got to say and John, it's yours again. All right, thank you, Eric. Welcome. All right, uh, next we have Benjamin Green. Uh, he worked, he's uh, going to tell us all about the updating of the, uh, uh, of the dam uh, that is coming to a reservoir near us. Um, if you'd like to stand over here, Benjamin, and when you want to advance the slide, just hit the space bar button. Okay. If you need to go back, just use the back arrow. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ben Green. I'm a dam safety engineer at the Department of Environmental Conservation Dam Safety Program, one of the uh, caretakers of Waterbury Dam. Uh, very much thank you for the opportunity to present uh, on the ongoing project uh, at the dam today. I uh, kind of imagine that pretty much everyone at this meeting is probably intimately familiar with the reservoir and probably darn familiar with the dam as well, but just to sort of set the stage for the, the talk here, um, I'm just going to do a brief overview. Some of the main statistics on the, the dam are listed there on the right. Um, uh, you know, the dam is a Depression era uh, constructed, Ar Army Corps of Engineer designed, Civilian Conservation Corps constructed uh, dam that was handed over to the state and is owned and operated by the state. Um, it's uh, one of the more formidable dams in the state, one of the largest ones, certainly the largest ones in the state's portfolio. Uh, this is, I guess, I hope you folks can see this pretty well. This is a like ortho, uh, ortho image of the, the dam from Google Earth. Just the main components are the embankment, the uh, gatehouse, and the uh, pipe that conveys water from the spillway uh, down to the little river under most conditions, and then our spillway system, which is really the subject of our, of our project. And this zoomed photograph uh, shows the two main components uh, of the spillway, the, the gated section and the ungated section. The gated section uh, is the main flood control uh, element at the dam. The flood control band at the reservoir is roughly from the water level you can see in this photograph to the top of the ungated, ungated section. So just to give a little more project background, we're actually maintaining a website uh, that tracks this project. It's admittedly a little bit out of date and in the process of being updated right now, but it's a good resource for information uh, on where the project is. Um, this project originally came about in the early 2000s during test operations at the gate. They, uh, they, uh, they jammed during test operations and it was determined that deteriorating concrete and expanding concrete were the reason for that. And at that time, roughly like a 15 year uh, design life on that repair was assigned. So we're kind of past that now. Um, also at that same time, uh, they, they performed some uh, structural analysis on the gates and determined that the gates can't be safely operated under a major flood event. And so at that time, a flood, uh, flood load restriction was, was uh, placed on the gates. So we actually cannot hold a, a complete flood pool, which would be uh, holding water at the top of the gates, essentially. We have to actually stop uh, flood control prior to that uh, with the current deficiencies with the gates. Uh, another element that came into play was uh, Green Mountain Power when they uh, relicensed their facility through FERC. Uh, a new water quality certificate came out of that, and amongst other environmental requirements was one to do away with the winter draw, historic winter drawdown at the reservoir. Um, and that was uh, um, perhaps a nice goal, but something that can't be achieved with the uh, condition of the current spillway. Uh, so through some federal legislation, the state has teamed with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and we're doing a 35% state match, 65% federal match project 
Uh, it's a roughly, roughly estimated to be a $60 million uh, project to assess and repair the spillway. Uh, so the main project goals uh, are pretty straightforward. Number one is to restore flood, full, full, uh, full flood capability to the dam, uh, continue to support historic uses, um, hydropower and recreation, and ultimately the end to seasonal drawdowns, uh, which is uh, hopefully will improve water quality. Uh, and from my standpoint as well, uh, it's going to certainly improve our operation to maintenance at the dam and the public safety associated with the dam. Um, these are kind of two neat photographs of a similar location, uh, one from 1959 when that was about the time that the third uh, radial arm retainer gate was added to the dam. Um, prior to that, there was just the, the, the two. And these two are 20 feet wide, and this one's 35, and again, this was added in the late 50s. And this is what it looks like today. So the project steps, um, by all said and done, we'll be at this for about 10 years before we're done. Uh, we've already been at it for a little while. Um, working with, through the core uh, assessment and design process is not fast, uh, but it is thorough. Um, so the first step in the process was to uh, do what's called a risk assessment. It was a, called a semi-quantitative risk assessment, and that was completed in 2021. Basically, that uh, helped us to confirm that we were focusing on the right project by going after uh, the spillway modifications and spillway improvements. Uh, the next step that we moved to that we're currently in is called the dam safety modification study. Basically, we're, 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 step, we're, we're working off the, the previous work and doing additional study and analyses and uh, collection of field data uh, mm -hmm. to further support uh, potential improvements to the dam. Hopefully, we'll be done this step uh, spring 2024 and then move into design. Um, final design roughly estimated by the Corps to be a two-year process, so if that brings us to about from 2024 to about 2026, and uh, construction to follow, which uh, is estimated to, we're not exactly sure how it's long, long going to take yet because we don't know exactly what we're doing, but it'll probably be at least a two-year two -year process. So construction, you know, actual physical change out of the reservoir is still you know, a good little ways away, but we are working through it. We sort of started at 50,000 feet. We, we've, we've zoomed in a little bit to 40,000. Maybe we're like at 35,000 feet right now. And eventually, we'll, we'll have really good optics on exactly where we're going with this project and uh, how to most effectively and efficiently uh, spend the money and, and buy down uh, risk for the project. So just to go over a little bit of the completed uh, work that's been done, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first step was a semi-quantitative risk assessment. Uh, I presented on this uh, in past presentations, so I won't go into a lot of detail of what we did here, but basically the outcome was we identified potential failure modes of the dam. Uh, what are the fragilities? What are the, and we looked at, it was done holistically, we're not looking at just the spillway, but we looked at the dam in its entirety. Uh, we have $60 million. We want to make sure that we're spending that most effectively to buy down risk. Um, and while we certainly are aware of the deficiencies of the spillway, are those actually the most critical items to take care of? So that was ultimately the first step. And, um, uh, so ultimately, we initially identified, I think, roughly 50 uh, PFMs, or potential, potential failure modes. And then through analysis, those got trimmed down to five critical ones, which are listed here. And sort of the two that rose to the top were the spillway stability and tainer gate failure, um, potential failure modes, which are spillway related to which sort of validated the project that we're, that we're set out to do. Um, the next step was to move to a quantitative risk assessment, which is basically building on the, 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 the semi-quantitative risk assessment and really focusing on just those two spillway failure modes. Um, there's been a lot of structural analysis for sliding and overtopping stability of, of the elements at the spillway, um, and also uh, the other failure mode associated with tainer gate failure. Um, the way that Tanner gate works, as many of you are probably familiar, they're like a big door and they, they swing down when they're closed and we pull them up when they're open. They're, there's cables that are connected. This is not Waterbury, don't worry, that didn't happen. Um, uh, they're connected to the leading edge of the gate and uh, so they're pretty efficient and they can be lifted with a relatively small amount of energy and they can store a lot of water. But one of the defic historic deficiencies with this type of gate is the hinge or the trunnion that they, I guess this isn't a very good picture of it, but the trunnion or the hinge that the gates swing on, when these were designed, the design guidance for many years did not uh, have you include the friction that builds up in that pin. And this is an example of a dam that failed, Folsom Dam in California in 1995 that was determined to fail because of the uh, friction buildup in the, in the trunnion. Um, then, and as I mentioned earlier, the analysis done at Waterbury Dam indicates that we're also susceptible to a similar style failure. So um, you know, trunnion friction has kind of been a big subject of this, of our work. Then are, are all three tanter gates at the same 
sort of condition and all need to be uh, reworked? Yeah, when the initial analysis was done, I think, I think they came up with slightly different um, uh, ele elevations where those may run into issues. Um, and we're actually, uh, I'll move in, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we've actually been studying the trunnion infection and I don't have the results yet. We just took the data last month, but we're, we analyzed each gate and each trunnion to determine uh, where they stand. Um, the field work that, that just was completed last month, the first part of it was uh, concrete uh, and bedrock uh, testing and uh, cores. A multitude of it were drilled throughout the dam in both spillways and the ungated, uh, all three spillways in the ungated spillway section and the spillway bridge. Uh, they were collected and they're going to be analyzed um, and that we don't have the results back yet but but that work was successfully completed uh, the other part of work that just, just finished up was the trunnion friction testing and this was a pretty neat a pretty neat analysis that was done um, through rope access uh, a, a company called uh, bridge uh, dynamics uh, visited our site and they installed strain gauges on the strut arms of each of the gates um, and then uh, they monitored that instrumentation. We ran the gate through a multitude of heights and variants. And from that, uh, we've given all the results back yet, but from that, they're able to calculate very accurately what the buildup in the uh, trunnion friction is in, the, in, in those joints. And so that will help us to really understand how much of a problem trunnion friction is or isn't in our site here. And like I said, we don't have the results yet, but that was pretty compelling work, and hopefully we'll, have, we'll find out they're, they're really not as bad as, as bad as maybe that original Army Corps assessment. Uh, evaluate it to be but uh, so we're, we're still we're sort of heading towards design but we're not there yet there's a lot of discussion of different what are rehabilitation alternatives that could potentially be implemented here to address uh, the, the, the issues with the dam and this is sort of a cartoonist sketch of, of, of some of the uh, kind of the, the, the leading ones I would say the Army Corps might scoff a little bit of me making this much conclusion but we talk a lot about it and this is sort of kind of where we're heading we've been talking about these things for a while so I'm Gaining relative confidence that, that the project's probably going to include a good number of these items. Um, for starters, uh, replace the degraded concrete. Um, the uh, entirety surface of that concrete all throughout the structure is probably going to be replaced. That's probably going to require uh, chipping down uh, one to two feet uh, into the uh, removing the deteriorated concrete, um, tie tying in dowels, reinforcing steel, and then uh, recasting new concrete uh, to original surface. Um, a second item that, that will most likely be undertaken or something uh, of similar is the install post-tension anchors. Uh, one of the things that's kind of come out in a lot of the stability analyses is that the original spillway system is not tied to bedrock in any way and it uh, has far, fairly marginal factors of safety against instability uh, when you compare it to like, modern standards. And so a way to improve upon that is to anchor the concrete to bedrock below. Um, again, th th those, those red dots are just sort of meant to show kind of a rough idea of where or where or not they may, may end up. Um, another element that's going to be included is rehabilitating the gates themselves. Um, I th I'm thinking that most likely at this point we're not going to be replacing the gates, we're going to be rehabilitating the existing ones. That's probably going to require removing the gates from the trunnions, uh, adding a bunch of structural members to the strut arms, reinforcing them, sandblasting them, recoding them, and reinstalling them. Uh, and then uh, also along with that will be a demolition of the existing access bridge, construction of a new stronger bridge that can handle the lifting loads uh, better than the existing one, uh, as well as new lifting equipment and operating equipment. Uh, and then I think kind of the other item that's really kind of come out from these risk assessment work is that uh, the bedrock quality at the site is, is subpar and uh, the spillway has never really experienced tremendously high flows, and yet we have, we have uh, pretty good evidence of a fairly high amount of erosion that's happened. And so in order to arrest that or prevent that from causing, uh, eroding further and causing potential stability issues with the overall structure, um, some sort of a, a concrete apron uh, is likely to be uh, incorporated into the project. So, you know, in summary, we're currently in the study phase and we're moving to design. Um, hopefully by spring 2024, we're, we're moving slow. You guys aren't missing much yet. Um, there'll be lots of future opportunities for public education and public input. You know, right now, a lot of what I'm showing you is kind of like, this is where I think we're going. We don't really have a lot of hard things to show yet. And that's, that's why there hasn't been a lot, but there will be more as we start to really zero in on the project. You know, construction is not gonna be anticipated till the 2026 to 2028 timeframe. So we're still some years away from um, what's gonna happen there. Um, one item, two items that I just wanted to talk about, I guess I brushed over when I was talking about this slide was, um, you know, two of the challenges that we're just starting to 
uh, unravel, I guess, and, and start to figure out our one is how we're going to access the site with you know the adequate construction equipment to perform the work, and the second is how are we going to manage water levels and how are we going to manage flood protection requirements during the work. And I don't have answers for either of those questions, and I know that's probably two that are most germane to this group. Um, but those are just items that are just sort of kind of starting to be discussed now. Um, and so I, th those will be largely impactful to the public, um, both upstream and downstream. And uh, like I said, we're, we're just kind of starting to, to scratch the surface of those issues. So with that, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. And uh, imagine there's time for questions or... Yeah, let's, uh, we can take a couple of short questions if there are any. Are going to start draining the resi? Start draining? Yeah. Uh, it's not clear yet. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we're, how, you know, if we are and how much we're, if we are, if we do, how much we will. Um, it's hard, hard to say right now. I think the, one of the leading ideas is that some drawdown is going to be necessary because uh, we're going to probably need to remove this, the gates during the work until there's going to be no ability to provide flood protection downstream. So in order to do that, we're going to need to provide flood protection in the reservoir. So, mm -hmm. but we, that's still not, finalized. But it's based on the 2026 construction time, correct? Do I, am I following you right? If, 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 you need, if you did need to draw down mm -hmm. to do that work, it wouldn't be until 2026? It'd be in that, yeah, in that time frame, yeah. It'd still be a long ways away, and there's still, you know, these uh, concepts I showed you are very conceptual, and so, you know, there's, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. There's a lot of talk about try to do one gate at a time and try to do less of a drawdown and, and shift flows and you know it, it adds you know there's costs and risks that need to be kind of evaluated with every one of those options but um, and we're not really not really very far down that road a question um, you know I can't I don't know the dates but 15 20 years ago there was a major repair to the dam mm -hmm. now we're gonna have another major repair not that I, I I'm fully understand that for safety and a lot of reasons that mm -hmm. it's necessary, but it does have an economic impact on this community. Are we going to expect every 20 years there's going to be major redos of, of the dam, or is this kind of it? I, I certainly hope not. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, I, you know, I think one thing that's sort of the... the we the, call it 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the risk assessment process the, the real value of doing that first in the project, if that had been done prior to that um, project that was done 15 or 20 years ago, that project may not have been the one that got done at that point. It may have been this one. Right. So um, yeah, that was not really standard practice at that time. Um, but I think you know, we have, it, it kind of gave us a great idea of the expanse of what really our, our fragilities are at the dam and what, what we need to focus on. And uh, we've addressed the seepage issue. Um, and now we're addressing the spillway. and. You know, hopefully the dam will continue to perform adequately into the future and it will sort of uh, have taken care of the main issues for, for a sizable period of time. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, no Appreciate problem. it. If you have any more questions for Ben, write them down and we'll get them to him and then we'll get the answers to you. Uh, all right. Uh, coming up next, uh, we have uh, uh, Francine with a financial report. So I, once a year, I like to report to the community about our finances. I think it's important for people to know what we're doing and how we're using the monies that people are giving us. Um, and uh, I would say that we're ending this year in, in what would be a good financial position. Um, and we, well, we do have some reserves entering next year, which is exciting for us. A lot of years we haven't had that. Um, right now, I believe we have a, a little bit under $5,000 of reserve going into 2023. Um, so far to date this year, we've received $2,014.10 in direct public support. And that's people just giving us money out of, out of the kindness of their heart and also really understanding the importance of what we do. Uh, we also do have an Agency of Natural Resources grant, the one that Eric talked about that's a pass-through grant that's managed by the town of Waterbury. And they are um, 
we are expecting to receive that grant money. It's basically based on our performance. So we've finished all the paperwork, submitted all of our reports, and we will have an, an extra $3,400 hopefully coming from them that will go into next year. Um, again, uh, we have received the $500 from the town of Stowe. We have another $1,000 coming from the town of Waterbury. So in reality, um, you know, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, we have up till through today between grants and public support and appropriations, uh, we've had about, well, I can give you the exact amount, $3,656.10 with the additional $4,408 coming in the next month or so. Um, our operating expenses are pretty modest, and I will tell you that they're modest because we have a very engaged working board. So the board of directors does not get paid, but they're uh, incredibly valuable to what we are able to accomplish. And because of that, we're, we're able to do a lot with very little money. Um, we have um, the one program that is fairly expensive for us, based on just the size of our organization, is the a, Aquatic Invasive Species Program that the Agency of Natural Resources does give us a grant for. It doesn't pay for the whole program. It pays about, right now, about 50%. There is talk that they're going to be lowering the amount that they're going to have available for different towns to, to um, ask for this grant. We're not quite sure where it'll be. There's a lot of changes happening there, so and keep informed. I believe, I've heard it's about, it's gonna be a drop of close to 30% of available funds. So, and that's, this is a statewide program. Um, so we are asking, for, we're all taking from the same pot of money, quite honestly. So, you know, we'll see what happens. That is why we're doing a, maybe a little more fundraising this year because we feel it's an important program to, to continue. Uh, aquatic invasive species have been a problem in a lot of lakes in Vermont. Uh, we've seen milfoil and other invasives really pretty much create dead lakes. Um, we're trying to avoid that happening here. Um, whether, if nothing else, maybe we can slow it down. Um, we do have a, an invasive in the lake, it's called um, brittle naiad. It's been there since the last drawdown in the early 20s. And it seems to have a cycle where it gets really thick. End of summer, hot water. It blooms mostly at the Cotton Brook end of the reservoir where canoes come in. It's very shallow there. So, but a lot of what we're doing is not only preventing invasives coming into the lake, we're also hoping to prevent brittle naiad going out of the lake to another lake around us. Um, we have other, you know, so if you want actual numbers, uh, this year the total cost of running this program, the Aquatic Invasive Species Program, $6,331.44. Um, we also um, have done a few other things with the monies that we've raised. We were able to, Last year, we were able to raise a lot of money. We had a lot of really great support from various people and organizations, and um, so we were able to donate some money to the Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. They're out on the lake. They don't always have the monies for their tools, so we were able to buy them some battery-operated tools, which was really exciting, and, and I know that they appreciated it and were able to do a lot more of their repairs using that kind of equipment that's not always available through the state funds. So that was about $287 we're able to donate. And then really the rest of our um, costs are mostly uh, office supplies, some printing. Yeah, we were using Zoom a lot, so we had to buy a Zoom account. Um, post, you know, just, just very general liability insurance. Um, so the entire extra cost is a little over a thousand it's one thousand two hundred and twenty one dollars and twenty three cents so anyway so far this year we've spent in actual cash not in kind uh seven thousand eight hundred and forty dollars and sixty one cents um so i want to just add uh we're really proud about of being stewards of all of these funds that are donated to us and as well as the partnering that we've had to do, what we do and we do gladly with the state agencies that are involved with this project, with this dam. 
and with the beautiful reservoir, we uh, we have a very passionate and just a, just a great group of um, of board members and volunteers, and um, they're willing to roll up their sleeves and go to work, and we couldn't do it without them. Um, you know, if you, you know, again, a lot of what we do is we do have to ask for money. That's that's mm -hmm. the bottom line. Um, but we are also really, really happy with the support that we're getting from our local community. And, um, and not just Waterbury, Stowe, all of the community that uses this lake. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal group of people. And I will say um, one last thing. Um, you know, if any of you are interested in joining our board or becoming volunteers, just please let us know. And you know, we're, we've got a full board right now. We need nine people to run, and we have nine people, but people come and go. And if you have any interest in joining us, let us know. We'd like to at least have your name in a bucket and, and call you, and certainly volunteers. Uh, we can't do it without you. Anyone who has any questions, you, you know, and I can show you very open. Our books are very open for anybody to inspect. Um, just call me. I'm, uh, but I say we do a lot with very little money, quite honestly. That's it. Any questions for Francine? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Proving that it takes a village to take care of a reservoir. Let's see, I think coming up next is um, is our greeter supreme, uh, Zach Johnston. The floor is yours. Hit the space bar to advance. Sounds good. So yeah, my name's Zach Johnston. Um, I'm one of the greeters on the reservoir. Um, this year we had several, which was awesome, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, we've been doing this program since 2016. Um, so you might ask, what's an aquatic species and why do we need to look out for them? So an aquatic species is uh, any non-native species um, whose introduction uh, can do harm to the environment that it's in. Um, so aquatic species, they can transfer a lot of different ways, mostly through people. Um, the, the, big, the big thing that we do is, is educating people on how they, they can help um, prevent what we like to call hitchhikers, um, because most of the time it, um, the species will attach, like in between a trailer is, is the most common area. Um, and one reason why we don't want in, invasive species in our body of water is because they can just totally take over um, and change the ecology of the entire of the entire uh, reservoir. Um, here's our crew we had this year, and once again, we had really great fundraising, which is why I think in, in the past the the most greeters we've had is two. Um, this year we were able to cover so much ground because of the greeters we had. We were able to have greeters every weekend at both um, the Blush Hill boat launch and the Dam boat launch. Um, in the past, we would pretty much rotate back and forth. So it was really nice to be able to interact with everyone at the two busiest uh, boat launches that aren't the state park. Um, and also, we, we were able this year to have some greeters on during the week, which is really awesome because, um, you know, the, it's definitely different demographics who use the reservoir during the week versus uh, during the weekend. Um, so obviously, the weekend is when there's the most people, but it's it's really uh, important to to get get in touch with everyone and and uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, a little bit about the, the program. The state started it in 2002. Um, like I said, we started it in, in 2016 was our first year. There's over uh, 30 access programs in the state. Um, what do we do as greeters? Um, when boaters come, we, we uh, welcome them. Um, and we give a, a little bit of a, a background of who, of who we are and you know, why, why we do the work we do. And we offer um, complimentary uh, inspections, which 
pretty much looks like what's going on here. However, I've never seen a boat with this many invasives. That would be a real <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, but once again, the, the most common places where invasives get stuck is, in, is like in between the trailer and the boat itself. Um, and yeah, so if we, if we do find species, um, we, we identify them and just let the state know. Um, we, we also collect data on, on the usage and um, like how many, how many people have an understanding of invasives coming into it. And that number increases every year. Now, I would say almost everyone we talk to at least has like some idea of what invasive species are or why we don't want them to spread, which is really awesome. Um, and we also distribute educational materials. Um, so as Francine was saying, Brill Niad is our, our one invasive. Um, and we've had it since the last um, drawdown and as long as I've been involved. And um, Brill Niad really likes um, reservoirs because of the fluctuation um, in the water. And this is, this is, um, can't really see it too, too well, but there's a, a bunch of it here. I believe that's around the, the dam um, boat launch. And that's kind of what it looks like, um, yeah, in, in your hand. So the reason why it's called Brill Niad is because it breaks apart really easily. Um, and it only takes like little segments to, to spread to new areas. And when, when I first um, came about, it was definitely like in, in a couple of Kobe areas, but I think every summer it's definitely, you, you see it in new areas. And, and I, I remember Chad actually had, had a map and it was kind of amazing to see how much it had spread over the years. Um, here's, here's some um, other invasives that we've had um, intersec intersections with over the years. So Brill Nyad, obviously, and we do, especially in August, we like to check the boats as they leave. Um, just to let people know that not only can you bring invasives into the reservoir, but you can definitely bring them out. Um, and because the uh, because the NIAD does seem to hang around um, the launch areas, I think that's super important. Um, we we have had interceptions of Eurasian milfoil, just people coming in, um, never established in the reservoir. Uh, same thing with curly leaf pondweed. Um, the other thing that we sometimes get is. Um, people who have who have water, and the reason why we we are concerned with um, with with water coming from different uh, ponds or lakes is because in that water it, it can contain in, invasives. The, the big one is uh, zebra mussels. Um, their offspring is so small that you can't see them with your bare eye, which is why um, there there is a state law not not to transfer water um, and. That's why, because there can be like thousands of uh, zebra mussels in, in well, like not much of water. Um, one thing that I was excited about this year was um, the path at the dam that connects um, to the overflow parking. Um, because um, if you're familiar with that area, it's, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a walk to get to that overflow section and it's windy and kind of narrow. Um, so this path allowed people to kind of cut through the field and not have to deal with all the cars going through. Um, so that, the little things that make your day. <laughs> um, yeah, that's more or less what, what I have. I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do. Does anybody have a question for, for Zach? Zach, do you see any difference between in-staters and out-of-staters as to, you know, education on invasives? Good question. I would say the overwhelming amount of people who we have are local. Um, I would say better than 90%. Um, there's definitely, I would say there's definitely like a little bit of a drop off. Um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of our traffic is actually local, which is really cool. Um, so th there's a bit of a drop off, but but surprisingly, I, I think some 
a lot of different states have done really well. Like Maine has a really good program. Um, but yeah, so I think there's like a little bit of a drop off, but also the, the data is actually like pretty small because like so many of the people are actually local. Um, like 4th of July weekend is when you definitely see more. And those holiday weekends, I would say, you get a bigger percentage of, of people who don't know as much about it because they might just be out for the holiday um, and they might not be someone who's who's out all the time. So I would say that's where like the biggest drop off is, is the, the, the big holiday weekends. Do, do you think it's a lot of the out-of-staters over by the campgrounds and they're putting in a, at that access and where you guys are never at? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, at, at what one, at uh, Little River or yeah, I'm. I'm not sure because we, we don't really have any numbers, but that's a that's a super good question. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I have one question. You talked about uh, boats transporting water, and I'm assuming we're talking bigger motor boats. Is it the weight boats that? Uh, I mean, what? Uh, I may be a little ignorant on who transports water with their boats. Yeah. So um, it's. All different kinds of motor boats. Um, there's there's both um, the there's both the, the live wells um, that carry the fish, like that's a threat. But also um, the the water from the the drain plugs, like that's why you you it is a state law to have your uh, drain plug out when you travel, and, and that's and that's why actually one of the big things we do is we remind people to put their drain plugs back in uh, before before they go into the reservoir, because I've definitely seen it a few times where um, people haven't, and uh, I feel like I would probably make that mistake too, so. Oh, I've but. seen it, I've seen it too. I almost go under. Awesome. Thanks, hey, Zach, weren't you there, weren't you, didn't you start doing this program in 2016? I did, yeah. <laughs> the original creator. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Really appreciate your help with this program. He's he now supervises it, and uh, yeah, wow, increasing uh, success. All right, uh, Sheila is next. So. Uh, my black screen and then there's your black screen and you have a space bar when you're ready oh this space bar yeah space bar is the big <laughs> yes, one yes i know well very good i'm not an <laughs> apple mac person okay so i'm just briefly going to talk about some of our uh, wildlife endeavors and our wildlife protection projects that we've done um the first is about our loons um and i think it was 2019 I was absolutely incredulous to see loons nesting on Waterbury Reservoir at the northern end. They'd never nested before, at least not that was documented. The reason loons can't ne have trouble nesting on a reservoir is for the fluctuating water levels. Their nests get flooded. And they need, because they can't walk on land because of their an anatomical structure, they have to nest near the water. So we had never seen them. I was out paddling one day and holy crap, I got a video of the loons on the nest. I came home, I got in touch with Eric Hansen at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. He's like, no way. I said, Eric, here's the proof. <laughs> so unfortunately, that nest was flooded by one of our common high water rain events. However, and that was in June, in August of that year, Eric Hansen came out and Francine and Eric and I, we went out with Eric Hansen from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies and we built a loon raft. The idea on the loon rafts is, where there's an area of fluctuating water, the loon raft, because loons like islands because it protects them from predators and they, they're not too far from the water's edge, the raft will fluctuate with the water level and they've been very successful at many other lakes in Vermont. So we built this thing, which is quite an endeavor if you've never built a loon raft before. And unfortunately, the loons have yet to nest in it. There is a pair of loons they hang around. I caught them mating last summer, but they, for some reason, they don't like the invitation to our beautiful, well-foliated loon raft. So with the help of rain, the rangers, the floating rangers, we can't do it without Ben and Chad and his folks um, and Eric and Francine. We go out and Mike Bard. We're out in the muck and the mud, and the low water every spring to get that in position, get the new foliage all put up, make it nice and inviting for the loons. I've got videos and pictures of them swimming right around the raft, but they've yet to nest on it. And this pair, 
they may be young, they may be inexperienced, they may not be a great couple, as it were. We don't know, but we will set it up next year. Um, and we will hope again that if they don't nest there, it's in an area that has the kind of environment that the loons like. And we're hoping, every year we hope, maybe this will be the year that they actually nest again. And even if they don't actually hatch chicks, it would be a step to have them establish a nest. And then a next step would be for them to lay an egg or two. And then hopefully we get some chicks out of it. So that's, a, that's an ongoing effort every year. Our other big program that we started last year was in response to an incident. And two or three years ago, Ranger Chad, those of you who are on the reservoir a lot in the last few years know Chad Ommel, had to rescue a cormorant that was entangled in fishing line. Now, I don't know anyone that's a big fan of cormorants, other than they pose really nicely for photographs. They're really great for posing for photos. But even a poor cormorant doesn't deserve to starve to death with fishing line entangled around its beak. So Chad rescued it, whatever, and saved it, unraveled it, and the bird went free. It has a little nick in its, had a little nick in its beak, but it was fine. Well, I had been aware of other programs throughout the Northeast to help prevent this kind of occurrence happening because cormorants, we also have loons, we have eagles, we have herons, we have green herons, we have black crown night herons, we have mammals, the minks and the otters that hang around on the shoreline that are endangered by fishing line that's left along shorelines, in snags, um, in the water. So one of the programs that U.S. boating and other conservation groups have put together is a fishing line recycling bin program. And the idea is you have a bin at accesses where people go, and the monofilament fishing line, instead of people just throwing it on the ground or throwing it in the water or even taking it to a landfill, because it can be dangerous to birds in landfills, the idea is you take your fishing line recycling and throw it in here. And then we, as volunteers, collect it, and Dick Sporting Goods and other places will recycle it so that it doesn't go back into the wild, it doesn't go to landfills where it can endanger other birds as well. So we got approval from the state summer before this past summer to install three. And I will admit, I was a little dubious because Connecticut said, oh my gosh, it will be filled with diapers, beer cans, everything you can imagine, poop bags, everything you can imagine. I said, well, let's give it a try. We won't know. Well, the state gave us approval for three. And if you ever see, if you look on our website under projects, there was a report I did last year on our loon project. And it has pictures. If you've been to the Adirondacks, or you've been to New Hampshire, you may have seen other such bins. They're usually just white PVC with an elbow at the top. They're real boring. They're real industrial looking. And the state said, oh no, you can't do that. They have to be dark green, they have to be brown, they have to fit in. So Eric Chittenden took the design and ran with it and developed, this is our design. This is classic. We have the best design fishing line recycling bins in the country. <laughs> and we have not had them vandalized. We have had very little trash, and people are using them. This year, we added a fourth bin at the dam access area. I monitor the Cottonbrook bin, for example, and of the times that I check, I check it at least once a week, and 50% of the time I checked it, there was fishing line in it. And the only trash I found all season was one cigarette butt. And yes, we're also finding lures, bobbers, sinkers, leaders, but you know what? That's okay. Because I'd rather have them go in here than be left along the side of the shoreline where a heron or some other bird will pick up the lure thinking it's a real frog and ingest it. So that's our fishing bin program. Next summer, we will be in five spots on the reservoir. We also have been working with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. They wanted a copy of our plans, a copy of our project. The state has gotten copies of our plans because the Loon Conservation Project with Eric Hansen is also interested in getting such recycling bins set around the state because of the issues that they've had to recover loons that have been entangled in fishing line. 
So we're kind of, we've done really well. We keep our fingers crossed every year when we set them up that it's going to be a good year. We've had two really successful years, and next year will be our third. And that actually leads to a reason that we're kind of expanding next year. This is a young second year eagle, bald eagle, hangs out at Cottonbrook a lot. Or I should say used to hang out at Cottonbrook. These pictures I took of him in June and July. And in October he was dead. Despite the hard, tough efforts of our rangers and Chad Ummel and our, and our game warden, I think it was Chad Barrett, was it? Chad Barrett. The poor eagle was grounded. I was contacted by the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences to transport the bird because I'm a transporter for Vins. I ended up not transporting it because the rangers got permission to transport it. He was grounded, staggering, in bad shape. This was in the middle of October. And it was determined that he had 13 times the lethal load of lead in his blood. The 100 milliliters per deciliter, whatever blood, is considered a lethal load, and he had 1,300 of lead in his system. And he had a lead sinker in his gut. He had a lead sinker that had completely was corroded, deteriorated, and it killed this bird. So that's an eagle that we will not see at Cottonbrook anymore. I've been watching this bird for two years. I used to call him Eli. And his, possibly his parents, an adult and a subadult eagle are still around. But I worry about them. Oh, that's OK. <laughs> I worry about them because I've seen the eagles. They fight over a fish. So if poor Eli ate a fish that had a had lead sinker in it, or he found a lead sinker and they're sharing food. If carrion, you know, a dead deer, if a deer is shot with lead or a bird is shot with lead shot and the eagles are feasting on the carrion, they share that carrion. So what we're going to do next year, Vermont Center for Eco Studies got a federal grant out of some money for, as the state got, for putting up with something. I'm not sure what it was. But the Vermont Center for Eco Studies is also adding to their loon protection program, adding a lead buyback program. And they kind of started it last year, and I've already been in touch with Eric Hansen and Eloise, his assistant, if, I don't know if you any know Eloise, is also working on the lead program. So we're going to be coordinating with them, and what we'll probably be doing next year is we'll be adding informational signs to folks. Uh, making people aware of how they can get it par become part of the lead buyback program. And hopefully, this will be the last eagle for the last loon that we lose on the reservoir. Thanks, Sheila. Back. Appreciate it. If you have any questions for Sheila, go ahead and grab her elbow. Um, we're going we're gonna to step right along uh, because we have a report from our floating ranger, uh, Ben F Floaten, is it? Fulton. Fulton. Oh, there I go. All right, typo there. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's see, is that yours? Yep. Hey, what do you know? All right, uh, I'm Ben Fulton. I am the uh, floating ranger slash uh, park manager for Water Bay Reservoir and its remote mm -hmm. campsites. Um, I'm going to keep it pretty short. Um, this year, we saw a pretty big change in our staffing. Um, Longtime Ranger Chad Ummel uh, was promoted to Regional Operations Manager um, for Vermont State Parks. Uh, and I took over his position along with uh, two newcomers, Cody Smith and Philip Dudley, who are both new to uh, parks this year. Um, now, for the most part, people have been returning to their post-pandemic lifestyle, and as a result, uh, both camping and day use uh, have returned to a much more manageable level uh, than it's been for the last few years. Um, with the exception of, you know, pretty busy summer weekends um, the, and holidays, the recreation at the reservoir has become a much more calm experience, and uh, visitor feedback that we've received this year reflects that. Um, Combined with uh, Waterbury Reservoir remote camping, Little River camping and day use, and Waterbury, Waterbury Center State Park uh, day use, we've had 
over 94,000 recorded visitors. And this does not include uh, the unrecorded visitors who come in from the Dam Boat Launch or Blush Hill Boat Launch or Moscow Boat Launch. Um, so yeah, potentially thousands more than, than the number we have. Um, with the new reservation system, we found that the quality of our campers has improved. Um, people who plan ahead tend to be better campers in our experience. Um, and as a result, there have been way fewer incidents of damaged plant life, vandalism, um, illegal campers in undesignated areas and undesignated fires. Um, all of these uh, types of incidents are at, uh, at a low right now, and that's great. Um, it makes, it makes camping a much better experience for all of us, and it keeps the reservoir looking good. Um, so with the reduction of incidents this year, we've had more time to complete some much needed projects. Um, we, we have completed a new day use area just south of site one um, in a nice little rock grotto type of area. Um, and we've installed uh, metal fire rings at all the remaining sites that hadn't had them yet. Um, so all the sites now have metal fire rings with metal grills, um, except for the few day use areas that are in flood areas. Um, we already heard a little bit about uh, our invasive brittle naiad, um, but here's a map that we made of our invasives. Um, we, we do this every year, and it seems that the spread of brittle naiad is slowing somewhat. Um, it, takes over mostly the shallow areas of the reservoir, um, mostly up north there, you'll see in red. Um, we also tracked uh, Japanese knotweed, which continues to um, come down from the Moscow boat launch. Uh, it just, it kind of floats down the, down the river there um, toward the dam. Uh, and then new this year, we found two uh, young black locust saplings um, on the Cottonbrook Delta. Um, I spoke with uh, one of the state foresters, and um, she didn't seem too concerned about it um, as long as we, uh, you know, hack it down uh, and and be on top of it every time it tries to grow back. It should be overtaken by the surrounding plants and and not be an issue to us. Um, right. So clean water. Um, we have. Two indicators here that we've had really clean water, um, as, as usual, on the reservoir. First is a quite large crayfish, um, the biggest one I've ever seen, um, really massive. <laughs> uh, it was actually found in um, one of the anchors for uh, the loon nest um, that, that Friends of Water Bear Reservoir help us put out, or that we help them put out. Um, and then the other is this weird blob looking thing on the right, it's called a bryozoan. It's a colony of single-celled organisms. This one's about a foot in, in diameter, um, attached to one of our ropes for uh, a buoy. And um, they can get up to two feet, um, and they're uh, an indicator of extremely clean water. So I was pretty happy to see that. I saw a couple last year, too. Um, future projects, uh, new day use area on the uh, peninsula south of Site 27. This is the peninsula that marks the no-wake zone uh, for the northern section of the reservoir. Um, there's a nice flat area with a rock outcropping and a small beach that I think will be great for day use. People already use it as a day use area. Um, we also want to repair the stairs at Site 15, um, which got uh, destroyed by a falling tree. Um, and yeah, that's uh, going to be one of our early projects next year. Um, we're also planning on putting uh, picnic tables at all the day use sites that are not in flood areas. Um, hopefully this will get people to use the day use sites for day use instead of campsites, um, which are usually reserved. Um, and then we also really want to replace our aging no wake buoys. Um, if you've been out there, you've seen you know, some of the, the, the lettering and the symbols are starting to come off of them. Some of them don't float quite so great. Um, so we're looking into that, but we don't yet have uh, funding for it. And then finally, I want to thank the Friends of Water Barrier Reservoir for their generous donation of power tools. Um, they were really helpful this year um, for repairs from outhouse doors to boat repairs on our boat. 
um, and also the great work they do with the loon nest and the and the uh, fishing line collection uh, and the greeter program. So yeah, if anyone has any questions. Hey ben, yeah. Ninety four thousand this year or was that this year. This year. Yep. Or 90, close to ninety five thousand. Yep. Is that a record, you know, or? Uh, I don't know that. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. All right, and finally, Kristen Sharpless and Alan Thompson are here. I hope. Because they're up next. And they're going to talk about the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. Yep. And here they come. <laughs> and folks, I do apologize. We are running late. Thank you for your patience and for hanging with us. What time is it? Oh, a quarter of eight or so. Okay. Are you trying to wrap up at eight? Well, we were. But. All right. I'll make it snappy. <laughs> okay. Um, well, good evening. Oh, we have till eight thirty. Oh, extra time. All right. Okay. Um, well, I'm Kristen Sharpless. Um, I serve as the executive director at Stowe Land Trust, and I'm pleased to be here this evening with you. Thanks for um, inviting me. And I'm representing the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor Partnership. So I want to acknowledge Alan Thompson with the Waterbury Lands Initiative is also here, and Billy was just here. He just stepped out. Um, Billy Victor is with the Waterbury Conservation Commission. So both partners, along with others, in helping to keep um, this internationally important corridor open and safe for wildlife. And it's a great tie-in to the work that you do with the reservoir, because the reservoir is in the corridor, as we'll see in the map. Um, I don't know if you're already aware of it or not, but it's a pretty cool uh, feature right here in Waterbury and Stowe. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about what the corridor is, um, why it's important, why it's threatened, um, and some of the conservation efforts that are underway to help protect it um, within this landscape. Uh, so just briefly, Stowe Land Trust, if you're not familiar with who we are and what we do, uh, we're a local land conservation organization based in Stowe, and we serve the greater community. Um, and in addition to partnering with others on projects like this to protect important habitat, we've been uh, for 35 years also protecting important farm and other forest lands in, in and around Stowe um, with a focus on recreation and public access and community spaces. Um, and connecting people to the land. So it's kind of interesting to think about you know, the wildlife corridor, as we'll see when we look at it, is home and habitat to many of us, potentially some of you. Uh, there's a lot of people who live in it, who travel through it, um, who have businesses in it. It's a pretty in, um, inhabited space with humans and also really critical for wildlife, so a, a really a shared space for people and wildlife. Um, and what we need out of the corridor and how we use it and how wildlife use it aren't always um, you know, supportive of each other. They can, there's a tension there. So it's an interesting space to be working in and connecting to. Uh, so just for some context in, in terms of kind of showing you why this um, corridor stands out in a, in a really big picture view, this is um, the whole northern Appalachian Acadian region, as we call it, essentially the northern forest. So outlined in blue there. Um, and Vermont is right here. And this is showing uh, really important in the colored blobs these linkages. So when we think about terrestrial animals, moose, bear, um, critters that have pretty wide ranges, travel long distances, um, how they move through landscapes over seasons or generations. They really need an intact, connected landscape, largely a forest. And that can include wetlands and waterways and 
um, places like the Waterbury Reservoir, but it's really dominated and embedded by forest and embedded in forest. And it's pretty extensive forested region, but it's got a lot of people in it, a lot of um, developed areas. And so when we think about what it is that allows animals to move through this really large landscape, it's really often the connections between other large areas that are really critical. And on a very large scale, these blobs are really important connecting forest linkages. So right here, um, we call this the, the Northern Green Mountains. This includes Mansfield and, um, you know, we're, we're right, right in it. And then right next door is the Worcester to the Northeast Kingdom um, linkage. So two really internationally important large blocks of forests that are connecting as animals move across the landscape, um, both north to south and kind of east to west between um, the Adirondacks and moving up into Maine, thinking about down into Massachusetts and moving up into, into Canada. And they intersect and cross really right here, um, or just north of here, in the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. So right there is us. Um, as we zoom in, this is the um, kind of the outline of the wildlife corridor with the Worcester Range here and the Green Mountains here. This is the Still Waterbury Town Line. This is about a 10,000 acre area um, that defines what, when you, it's a big area, but when you zoom way out, it's really just a tiny little piece of forest um, or intact, relatively intact habitat. And really the only place between Waterbury and Stowe where you have that connection still there for wildlife to move through. So why is it important? Why does it matter? Um, I mentioned already that uh, right, animals move across the landscapes for all kinds of reasons. We've heard some great um, information about aquatic animals, about avian species uh, who move either through the air or through, who swim, but for land animals who are traveling um, over terrestrial environments, right, spaces like this can be really critical for seasonal migrations, getting from between winter and summer habitats, or um, movement in response to climate change where they're moving out of an area where it's no longer suitable, seeking um, more suitable habitat as young disperse, looking for their own territories or for mates. There's a lot of reasons why animals are moving at different times of year or different times during their, their life, um, lifespan. And so there's a real need for them to be able to navigate through landscapes um, relatively safely. I suppose there's nothing really safe about being a wild animal, but through appropriate habitat, right? Um, and the big barrier in the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor, the biggest one, is Route 100. So busy state highway, just looking back here, it's right here, right? We're all probably very familiar with it. I drove on it today and actually swerved around a deer that had been killed trying to cross the road. Um, so for us, it's a connector. It's how we get from one point to another. We can um, navigate through the landscape for wildlife. It's a barrier by and large, and a, and a pretty significant one. Um, not just in terms of the fact that there's vehicles traveling fast, there's, but there's the volume and the, um, tra the patterns of traffic make it pretty hard to cross. I don't know how many of you tried crossing Route 100 on foot, but it's scary. <laughs> Alan and I were doing some um, surveys on the ground and it was not comfortable being on Route 100 trying to navigate, like, could we dart across the road? No, probably not a good idea. Um, so it's easy to imagine that for other critters, um, it's a, a challenging prospect to get across there. Um, and I also just want to point out on this map, if you're wondering where it shoots Maybe some of you already knew this. I did not before I started working on this project. But if you're wondering where the Shootsville Hill term comes from, the name, 
Um, the height of land right here on the town line is your, let's see, coming up right toward the boundary from either side, that is Shootsville Hill. So that's Shootsville. Um, if that landmark helps orient you. Um, so a big part of what we've done in the partnership, and this goes back more than 10 years now, um, before my time with Stowe Land Trust, and I've been there for almost nine years, uh, is public outreach, just um, sessions like this and drawing attention to the corridor and its importance locally, regionally, internationally, um, and doing outreach events and um, helping people get excited about the fact that this is right here in our very backyard. So these are some of the talks that we've done over the years. And there was actually just one last night um, that Billy helped organize on uh, the Family Forest Carbon Program. So these are, this is an ongoing series that we do. Um, and around the time that we started doing these initial outreach efforts, there was a lot of analysis going on at the state level um, about forest blocks and what, how to really think about habitat at a landscape scale. What is it that really matters at these big scales um, for wildlife? And so these areas in green are big anchor blocks of forest. They're very large. And these smaller one right here is a really important, much smaller but important connecting blocks. We call that a connecting block. You can kind of see the fragmentation of that with looks a little like starting to become Swiss cheese with building envelopes and just the human habitation of the landscape that causes the loss of forest cover. Um, and there's another forest block here. So essentially we're, what we're talking about within the corridor in terms of connectivity is this ha uh, forest cover um, and the fact that although there are thin and narrow pathways, they do connect. Um, and even right here at that main Shootsville crossing comes right down to the road. I don't know if any of you have ever seen animals at that point, but I think we were doing a talk early on, and on the way to the talk, someone saw a moose in the little wetland right there <laughs> at the corridor hanging out. Is that right? You're nodding, Alan. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Nice shot of it. Excellent. They made a <laughs> right on cue. Um, so you're probably aware the corridor has been a um, part of what really draw, drew it into the public eye was a contentious proposal to put a cell tower right on North Hill, um, right here, pretty much in the middle of the corridor. Uh, so that got a lot of attention, and it was that that I think catalyzed the most recent iteration of our partnership where local, statewide, fish and wildlife conservation organizations came together. Um, and not to fight the cell tower or to say this is something that we're um, going to advocate against, but more just in recognition that this is such a critical area, we really have to work together across town and county lines. Um, it's kind of an odd um, space in which to be doing conservation work. And so it uh, attracted the attention of a lot of partners. And this is the list of partners who have really been involved. Our conservation commissions, our local land conservation nonprofits, the Vermont Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy, our regional planning commissions, um, Fish and Wildlife, Forest Parks and Recreation, and the Agency of Transportation um, because of the Route 100 corridor going through there. Uh, it's a really great group. It's really fun working with folks who are, have these different scales and areas of focus um, and having a common area that we're all working to help maintain. Um, so the strategies that this group of partners kind of came together in 2013-14 to kind of try to figure out what could we do here to keep this area from just disappearing. Um, 
that came out of an initial strategic planning was one, a focus on permanent land protection. So being land trust, this is one of the tools we have in our toolkit. So if we can, can protect the forest on either side of the road, the um, even if the road gets harder to cross or, um, you know, it's still a really big barrier, at least there's habitat there to connect to. Um, engagement with planning commissions, um, both municipal and regional, because a lot of decisions get made, as you know, in your um, local and regional levels when it comes to planning and zoning about land use. Engaging landowners, there's hundreds, hundreds of landowners in the corridor. Um, all of them making different individual decisions about their property and uh, different levels of awareness. So engagement and cooperation with landowners has been a, a big priority for us. Um, enhancements to transportation. So there's lots of really cool projects out there about improving um, passage for wildlife under roadways, right, under bridges. Um, trying to figure out how to remove barriers to allow animals to pass. Um, and Shoesville is a really interesting spot because there is no culvert or bridge or anything under the road that we could make better for animals to move under or funnel them through there. Um, it's just rock. <laughs> so uh, there's like grand visions of, well, maybe a, you know, an overpass or a bridge for the wildlife to go over the road or the road goes under and we'll do a big dig someday. Um, so lots of creative ideas, none of them feasible yet, but who knows, someday. Uh, but thinking about how to manage roadways and on more secondary or town roads, there are lots of culverts and water crossings and um, places to make uh, improvements to just make it easier and safer for wildlife to cross. And then published public information and awareness is a big part of what we've done as well. Um, a really cool part of the project, which Alan could speak to in more detail, has been um, getting pictures of the critters in the corridor and um, collecting some data on different tracks um, so we know who's actually out there. We have done some good modeling and we know the forest cover is there, the habitat is there. Anecdotally, people see um, evidence of animals, but uh, Alan, do you want to speak briefly about this project and kind of what you did? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. You can't uh, hang out in the back. Is there other camera stuff? Yes. Uh, so, Do you want so, me to advance that? Those are the some of the. We started again. with a photo product with NR206, which is actually a really unique um, class at UVM that assigns, I think, freshmen, maybe sophomore, sophomores, 206, to community projects. And so you can go pitch your ID and say, "Hey, we'd like some help." In this case, we said we want some help doing some presence absence surveys of wildlife in the corridor, and. Uh, cohort of students came out and put up some cameras, did some tracking along the roads, and provided us some pretty basic information just about, yeah, we've got species out out there. And if you've ever engaged in trying to ask, well, are there deer out in the woods? It doesn't take long to find all the things, all the species you expect to find out there. So we wanted to expand on that a little bit and put out more cameras, and we independent of the students, we put out uh, eight cameras on both sides of Route 100 for a few years, and we got all the species that, are, that you'd expect to have, bobcat, coyote, moose, deer, fisher, mink, a lot of cool bird shots. Um, people. A lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people. In some cameras, <clears throat> there were many, many more people on bikes and hiking and people in their backyards, essentially, and that's, that's pretty much what this space is. From any single point in the, in the corridor, you're, you're within a half a mile from somebody's house, probably one of your houses. And so we might even have some of you on camera. But, but you've got a wildlife ecosystem out there that these cameras, they didn't take long just for us to go, oh, okay, yeah, this place is a living system with families of bears, bobcats, hunting, moose, traveling 
throughout this place. Uh, Jed Murdoch, no, is it Jed? The big moose study that was going on in Northeast Kingdom for many years finished up a couple years ago, but they put collars on moose in the Northeast Kingdom and followed them around forever and did some mortality work on it. But one of those collared moose ended up in Middlesex. And it turned around and went back a few days later. <laughs> but we had a ping, it wasn't me, but we they had a ping from that moose on the Elmore side, and then on the Middlesex side of the Worcester Range, and then again on the, on the other side of 89 in Middlesex. But it just goes to show that moose, one of the longest ranging wildlife species out here, is still quite happy in our backyard. So it was really fun, and of course, these photos are just a ton of fun to see. I mean, that guy is, that, that'll get a deer hunter's hackles up these days. A, a wildlife enthusiast will just love those. I love seeing Bobcat and Baby Fisher. It, it was a ton of fun. The landowners who hosted the cameras really enjoyed kind of seeing these, this stuff too, because they could you know, bring a greater appreciation to their property and their role in protecting the corridor. That took it's up a, a lot of time for a big slide. Oh, well, it's good. Okay. I think this is what they're most interested in anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to talk about <laughs> land protection anyway. <laughs> I won't go far. Thank you. Um, Uh, so the um, this this is a representing an analysis that we did collaboratively through the partnership, trying to answer the question of well, great. So this is a 10,000 acre area. Um, that's pretty big. There's a lot of land in there. Where are the most important places for wildlife connectivity? So this analysis um, really tried to answer the question of if you were a moose or a bear and you were over here, Hunger Mountain side, and you wanted to get over there to the Waterbury Reservoir, right? Because who wouldn't want to hang out at the Waterbury Reservoir? How, what would be the path of least resistance essentially through forest habitat to get from here to there? Or if you were there and wanted to get to the other side, so this is what that, this model is showing. And the purple areas represent those places um, that you can kind of thread through. And so it highlighted, one, you can really notice this pattern of um, the importance of streams and riparian areas, that there's a lot of, even if it's narrow, um, being able to travel along those waterways provides a lot of connections. And that can be true for hedgerows too, although I don't think that showed up in our um, modeling necessarily, but similar kind of concept. And then here on Route 100, it showed this was really the um, key crossing right here at Shootsville Hill, uh, right on the town line, just like we thought. Um, but there's a few other spots along here too that provide some important connections. So this really laid the groundwork for um, both outreach and education. This was a walk that we did um, on one of the properties that we worked with a landowner to conserve. Um, and for the larger public talks that we did. Um, and broader community engagement. I think this is a picture from a family day. Yeah, that was a in the corridor? Parents and kids teach, playing like games. up on the beer farm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, playing okay. games, talking about wildlife. And yeah. Get to your kids too. Right, and a um, photo contest. So there were some cool community engagement things that we've done over the years and a um, spotlight on Shootsville series in the paper. So hopefully some of you saw this. It's been a few years since we were running those that series. Um, and the modeling that we did also was um, in addition to giving kind of a platform for being able to talk to folks about the important areas in the corridor, 
is really information for towns in terms of informing town plans. So just in the most recent 2018 update of the Stowe Town Plan, the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor is now included and on a map that says this is an important area, um, which was not true, I, I think, prior to 2018. And the town of Waterbury, I think, has had it included for a while before Stowe did, yeah. right? In the town yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other piece of um, what we were trying to accomplish is securing and ensuring that forest co cover will um, be there for the wildlife. And so permanent land protection is kind of what Stowe Land Trust and Vermont Land Trust um, have brought working with local partners and the Nature Conservancy to the partnership. Um, and part of what we needed to do was raise some money to um, pay folks for their development rights or in one case for the um, property outright to try to improve the protections that were in place. I think back when we started this, there was only maybe a, two or three properties that had any permanent protection and that represented only about 6% of the corridor, so it's pretty vulnerable landscape. Um, so we successfully raised $500,000 um, to just do an, to do an initial round of land protection projects. Um, and these, this is that map again with the priority areas and the parcels in green have a conservation easement on them or were purchased and added to state forest in the case of um, this parcel here um, or were acquired this little 10 acre piece where the moose was, the one that was hanging out, <laughs> having its picture taken, um, the Nature Conservancy was able to purchase that. So now after um, being able to work with a few landowners and acquire and um, permanently protect a few parcels, there's, it's almost 20% uh, of the most important areas shown in purple are protected. So that's a pretty significant increase when we look at it. There's still a lot of purple that has no protection, um, but it's, it's definitely a good start. And we were really excited that when we reached out to um, some of these folks and shared just how special their land is in the context of the corridor, um, that there were people who were excited to work with us and um, conserve their property. So one of those was um, Eric and Dale Smeltzer, who you may know. This is their um, land right here that's not far from the reservoir. And um, they worked with Vermont Land Trust um, to donate a conservation easement or a donation of development rights on their 300 acres of forest land. So they'd been longtime landowners in Waterbury. Um, they really loved their woods, and they wanted to make sh sure they had a plan for how it would stay um, well stewarded and intact in the future. Um, it abuts state forest, um, included in addition to the woods, a lot of streams and wetlands and other wildlife habitat. So they donated an easement um, on 287 acres, and then this area around their house and next to their house was reserved out for a future home site. There's a wetland protection zone right here that was included, and then protections for the streams on the property. Um, and they were really an early adopter. Um, one of the folks who early on said they wanted to work with us which was great and inspired a few other people to get on board too. So that was really excellent. They hosted a game camera and this was from their property. Is that right, Alan? The, mom, yep. the yep. mother and cubs. Um, and through our fundraising efforts, we were able to cover the legal and closing costs for the project so they didn't have to incur those expenses. Um, so that, 
is that work was completed in 2020, 2020. Um, the first five protection projects, and we're currently working on another round and hopeful that we can kind of keep just like building a, you know, connecting a rail trail or a recreation path that, can, that goes through a lot of different properties. It's a long-term endeavor, so I think stringing together um, protected property is something that we all expect will take time and, um, you know, the effort of many people over time. So we just can keep showing up and checking in with people and seeing if now is the right time um, and trying to maintain that momentum. Um, another, the last component of what we've worked on that I mentioned earlier is just providing information and a, con, connecting landowners with an interest in managing their land with wildlife and connectivity in mind with some technical assistance. So this is Andrea Shortsleeves who was, uh, I think she still works for the Department of Fish and Wildlife and she at the time did outreach and engagement for landowners across the state. So we worked with her to host a workshop for interested folks who wanted to learn more about managing their um, forest land with wildlife in mind. And we're hopeful that we can partner with um, another great organization that's working on wildlife habitat connectivity up in the cold hollow to Canada region. So north of us in like Montgomery area. Um, and they've developed a really great program where interested landowners in an area form a peer-to-peer -peer network. So they get together once a quarter or so on each other's properties and share information and um, invite special guests to come uh, and teach them about topics that they are interested in that they've identified. Um, and then use that information to help enhance their management and estate, estate planning and kind of support each other in their conservation goals and coordinating them. And we think it's an awesome program and we would really love um, to replicate it and bring it to the corridor and provide those kinds of opportunities for interested landowners in our area. So that's kind of looking ahead to where we'd like to go. Um, there's the program that I mentioned that was just yesterday evening. If you missed it and you're interested in learning about what the Family Forest Carbon Program is, it was recorded and it should be online at the land, on our website within the next several uh, few weeks. So if you check there, um, you, can, you can learn more about what that is um, if you're interested. So I think those are the highlights I wanted to hit on. Is there anything important that you feel like I missed, Alan or Billy, that you want folks to know? No? Okay. Any questions, if we still have time? We do have time. We do have time. Question? Okay. Going once, going twice. So, hey, thank you for your good work. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. All right, well. hopefully first annual photo calendar uh, to support the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Uh, they are for sale, all profits are going to um, the program, and this is also an announcement that next year we are hoping to turn it into a community-wide photo contest. Uh, we're hoping to have somewhere that will host uh, an exhibit showing everybody's um, photos that wish to participate into the photo, column, uh, photo calendar contest. Uh, and then the public will be able to come in and vote on them and, you know, based on the seasons, uh, they will potentially get their own month. Um, and for those wondering, Francie's new nickname is Ms. January. Uh, that is the first <laughs> shot that is opening things up, but um, please do check it out. There's a few copies down in the back, and if you do 
um, think you want more or need another one down the road, uh, just contact Friends of Waterbury Reservoir and we'd be happy to send one to you or have one ready for you to pick up either at our shop or maybe even in Omeyak. Absolutely. Nice. Um, so thank you and back to you, John. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Uh, we also have a, a booklet over back there that uh, we're put together by one of our greeters, uh, I think, showing, illustrating the, the flora that's found around Waterbury Reservoir. Um, I think that's it. Please take some donuts and cider home with you because there's plenty left over. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.